everybody. I wanted to welcome you to our Zoom session tonight featuring livestock integration with crops. My name is Dave Scott. I'm a livestock specialist with NCAT. Uh, my wife and I also run about 200 ewes on irrigated pasture in Whitehall. And we're happy everybody came today. And, and uh, since it's a, a nice little cozy meeting, we were really hoping that you guys will ask a lot of questions from our featured speakers tonight. And uh, they have very graciously um, made two videos. Uh, one is Corey Fawkes and the other one is Tyrell Obrecht. They made videos this summer of uh, their operation integrating cattle with crops. And so I hope that you guys have had a chance to look at those full length videos, but if you haven't, you can always do so later on, they're on the ATRA site. So all you have to do is Google ATTRA and then click on the video section and they're the latest, latest videos that we have put up there. So they're right front and center in front of you. So I urge you to take a look at these videos. Uh, uh, Corey and Ty spent a lot of time on them and then there's a lot of information in there I think that you'll be interested in. Uh, this project, um, was designed and proposed by Devin Reagan, a research associate with Montana State University. She's here tonight. And we'll also um, ask her to describe a little bit about her project. And then if you have any questions about that project, uh, she'll be very glad to answer them. Um, NCAT's role in this project is doing outreach. And so we, in this year of COVID, we, we, kind of changed our, our system from live workshops to uh, virtual workshops like this one, Zoom sessions. So we're, we're hoping that this will get the same amount of information out to you and uh, everybody can benefit. A little housekeeping. Um, if you have a question or want to comment or anything like that, um, you have two uh, options. One is to raise your hand. Um, if you go to participants down there, uh, or yeah, participants, and you'll see a little hand raised there, you can raise your hand and Marianne, our, our great IT person will, will answer and, and then you can unmute yourself and then raise your question. The other way is to just type the question in the, in the chat box and I will be looking at the chat box and uh, I'll read your questions as they come in. Uh, if you're on the phone, joining us by a phone, uh, to raise your hand, all you have to do is punch in star nine. And then when Marianne recognizes you to, to speak, then you just unmute yourself by uh, punching in star six. So it's star nine to raise the question and star six to unmute yourself. And I think that's about all we have for, for housekeeping. Um, this session will be recorded and it will be up on the ATRA site. Uh, so all you have to do to find lots of publications and videos, podcasts, um, is Google ATTRA and everything will come up and, and everything is a free download brought to you by ANCAT. And so we urge you to check us out. Tonight, um, we are really pleased to have Corey Falk and Tyrell Obrecht. Corey is a uh, uh, cattleman and a farmer up by Sunburst and Tyrell runs, his family runs about 700 mama cows up by Turner almost before you drop off the cliff into Canada. So we also have Devin Reagan and she is gonna uh, come in after Corey and, and Ty. And so without any further ado, I'd like to to get Corey and Ty on. We'll start with Corey first. And Corey, could you just kind of give us an overview of your operation? And secondly, why you started integrating cattle in with your crops, please. Sure, you bet. So yeah, like you said, my name's Corey Falk. I'm in Sunburst, Montana here. And um, we got started, I actually started as an agronomist at CHS and I've been an agronomist ever since then. We still do the chemical retail end of things, but we started taking the family farm over when my dad got kind of sick, I guess it would have been in 2012. 
And at that point, he was still half fallow, half crop or whatever. And we started switching everything to continuous crop because we could see the soil health benefit of that. And then um, we did some intensive grazing and kind of saw the improvements there and some cover cropping. And, and we could really see the benefit of integrating the cattle into the cropping system once we started seeing the soil test results and the soil change and stuff. So it, it just started kind of small, forced stuff with cover crop with equip, equip contracts that we could see were working or whatever. And then we um, now we try to integrate the cattle anywhere we can, where there's water anyways in the cropping system, I guess. So, but it makes farming a lot more fun than trying to kill everything, I think, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Marianne, could you show us just a little snippet or two that from Corey's uh, videos and that'll get us rolling for some questions. So this is the seeding setup that we're using to seed these cash crops and the cover crops now. It's a Case 500 disc drill hooked to a 3555 cart. Um, th last year is the first year we used a disc drill. So I'm gonna walk you guys through some of the parts on this drill and stuff too. Um, because if you haven't used one before, it is a completely different setup, obviously, than what a hoe drill is. We switch from a 70-foot hoe drill to this 50-foot disc drill and are able to get at least as many acres per day done. Part of that is when that disc drill is running, there's very few things that go wrong. There's certainly more time at the end replacing discs than there would be replacing points in a hoe drill. But in season, this thing seems to be really low maintenance. Now, it is the first year we've run it. It is a new drill, so I will know more, I guess, as the years goes on as far as things that wear out. But so far, really happy with this drill. Um, basically, it's a single disc that slices at an angle into the ground, uh, leaves very little disturbance, throws a seed down in there. And then there's Needham, op Needham closers in the back of this, which are just a combined firming and closing wheel. Better that way. So that 3555 cart, it allows us to vary the rate of the seed. Um, like we talked about on the variable rate maps, which I'll take you through, and vary the rate of the fertilizer. It also has section control, so when every eight foot section of that drill gets into somewhere it's seeded, it's staggering it off. Really important for waste, basically, for us, because a lot of this has to be seeded at an angle to avoid hair pinning. Uh, we'll go through that too. I'll show you some hair pinning issues that we had. When you see it at an angle, obviously there's a lot of overlap in those ends, and we were still only running three to five percent on those fields. Before, with our hoe drill seeding straight north and south, we were running 10 to 15%. So that overlap control, I think, is something that would really pay for itself quick on this cart. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments on, on getting that crop in the ground? Anything that you want to ask Corey? Well, I got a question, Corey. What what depth were you seeding and and uh, how many acres could you do in a day? Sure, so pretty easy 300 acre day. And we only, we're, we don't push real hard. We might go from like seven in the morning till supper usually or whatever and quit. Um, most of that was seeded at six and a half miles an hour. And then we're putting it probably a half an inch deeper than what we did with the hoe drill. It seems like that helps with the hair pinning and the, packing portion of the disc drill. Like I, the one thing I read on the internet before we started the disc drill stuff is it's better to be a little deep than too shallow with those things. So had zero emergence problems because it places everything so consistent basically. But other than the hair pinning issue we had when we seeded straight north and south. But, but uh, All right. And the next video will show that that hair pinning that you described. And and so are you at two inches then total depth? Oh sure. So I'm like what that video is a seed and winter wheat, I believe it would have had to have been from this fall. So that was only probably got seeded at an inch to inch and a half deep, where before sometimes we would try and just barely put the seed in the ground with our hoe drill because some of it would get so deep. So this thing seems to place everything pretty consistent at an inch um, okay. with the, the barley and the wheat is where that would be, mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right. Um, well, Marianne, could we play the next uh, uh, snippet then? This shows the, the uh, yeah, there we go. So here you see our Case 500 disc drill running in stripper stubble. This is the first year we've seeded into stripper stubble. We have seeded into some pretty heavy residue. And, and one thing that we've learned, as you'll watch kind of as this drill is going, that you, you never want to seed right with the same furrow as the year prior. That's where your hair pinning problems are going to come in. So you'll see this drill 
It's actually seated at a 10 degree angle to the previous stubble and that, that keeps us out of the same row almost all the time. So 90% of the time we're not in the same row. The only time we will be is when we're crossing the row or when we seed the headlands basically. Like we talked previously in rocky ground, I think this disc drill is actually a better fit than a hoe drill. We're kind of looking up these rows and you can see here as we see where the drill seated across these rows when we get into where the previous year's stubble was, that's where we're going to really start to have our trouble with the hair pinning if we're going to have it. So there are the drills rolling along. The only time we cross over into the previous seated row is right here where that stubble's at. It might be hard for you to see, but there is a little bit of seed that actually ended up up above the ground or, or lodged in that stubble there. That's not a big deal if it's just one inch or half an inch out of a whole 10 inch row like we have here. But if you were to have your disc riding down that row the whole time, that's where we've kind of found that if we're gonna have hair pinning, that's kind of where it's gonna be at. The other thing you'll notice is on the ground here, the combine isn't spreading a lot of straw because um, with the stripper header, there's not a lot running through the combine. So we have a lot less straw residue to cut through now with the stripper header than we would have had previously um, with our uh, draper header running on the combine. The rest of it's all seated with our Case 500 drill, which you can find in a different video or a review of that. Um, you're gonna see we're seeding into some residue here. This is winter wheat stubble, and you can see there's very little bit of disturbance that this disc drill does as we're seeding into this stuff. So this is seed and cover crop. This was actually fall seeded um, attempt here is what we're looking at. And then you can just see the setup that we're using to seed it. Uh, Trimble auto steer hooked into a K700 and seeding about six and a half miles an hour. This is the uh, emergence of that cover crop just at the very beginning there. You can see some of the broad leaves coming up. Um, later on, we've got the turnips, radishes, and oats, and actually some mustard mixed in there, which was a, a bit of a mistake um, from our end as far as the cover cropping goes. And then here's just some pictures of those cows grazing on that cover on the annual crop ground, basically. You can see the portable wire fence going across there, so this was all intensive grazed. So this is taking a look at some fall seeded cover that we tried last year. We have such a short window between when the crop comes off and when it comes up that this is a harder one to pull off. But you can see a really good start to the turnips, radishes, um, some vetch in there. There wasn't a lot of top growth we got because we got snow at the end of September last year and it didn't rain on this stuff till about the second week of September to even get it out of the ground. But still really happy with the soil health benefits. So you're going to see as we dig this up, there's an amazing amount of root growth for the little bit of um, top growth that we got on this. There certainly was some grazing value left in that as well. So if you look underneath here, we're looking at a radish root right now. A turnip or a radish, I'm not really sure there. But anyways, those are really good at fracturing hard pans. This is vetch. You can see the nodulation on the vetch, and it's a really good plant for setting nitrogen and a good grazing crop. So you can see the variety of roots that we're putting in the ground all at the same time by seeding these different classes of crops. So we have oats there. Those are a forage oat, which are really high mycorrhizal fungi crop. We really like those for grazing and like them for the mycorrhizal fungi portion of it. There's some vetch with the nodulation. And anytime there's um, dirt stuck to the roots like that, you know that you're getting a lot of root, root exudates those plants are feeding the biology in the soil. You got a lot of bacteria working. So um, there's a, probably a radish, basically, that's really good at fracturing the soil. You okay. Well, Thanks for those snippets, Corey. Does anybody have any questions on, on what we just saw for Corey? Hey, Dave, I guess I have one. This is Tyrell. Yeah. So on that fall planted cover crop, Corey, are you, are you grazing your cows on it in the fall or is that something that like a winter wheat goes dormant and then comes back in the spring? Sure. You know, that's always been our like that, that's the ultimate goal, right? Is take a crop off seed right behind it and have cover come. And we tried that twice now and it got about that tall and then it freezes off. So I, we can't, it's so cold here that we can't get anything to overwinter very well, except for triticale maybe or whatever, which we're trying next spring. And so that we fall seeded with the hope we'd get maybe a couple more weeks of growth and then graze it in the fall, but it just, it did some soil health benefit stuff, but I don't know that it outweighed the cost of seeding it, you know? as far as that goes, but it was a fun project to try. And I think it would work if we took peas off in July and then we got a rain in August, 
you know, because we'd have a whole month of hot weather then to push that along. It just hasn't happened yet up here. So, but uh, right. But normally, you know, most of those are spring seeded covers that we do, anyways. But yeah, good question. <clears throat> Corey Rick has a question that he's typed in. He says, "What are you liking for your cover crop mix?" Sure. So in that one video, you can see the one thing we did screw up is, so we already had turnips and radishes, and so that's two brassicas in there. And then we had mustard seed left in the drill. And my wife does all the farming stuff, and I'm kind of her agronomist or whatever. And I said, we'll just use that pound of mustard up or whatever in the cover crop, right? Well, that pound of mustard is a lot of plants. And so if we can limit the number of brassicas, we were really big on turnips and radishes because they are high protein and they're really showy or whatever, right? Like they look good and they stay green a long time, but you don't get a lot of residue left at the end. And that's kind of one of our problems. So what we're switching to now more so is like uh, forage oats. We really like because they grow for a long time, even in the fall when it gets cold. And then we try to put some sorghum or um, some other warm season, like a millet in there, but those never compete very well in those crops. The vetch is a really good one because it doesn't screw our crop insurance up, but it's really high nitrogen fixing crop. And um, then sunflowers are okay as long as you don't let them get too big, but we've had customers that we sold cover crop mix to that the sunflowers got big enough that it broke nozzles on their sprayer when they're out spraying or they'll pop the valve open on the tractor and dump fuel out, you know, and stuff on the drain. So, so there's weird mechanical problems that come along with some of these too, but long story short, really like forage oats, a little bit of turnips and radishes or collards are really good because they don't bolt. The collards would be if you can get those in your mix. And then um, some sorghum or millet's nice just because that's a different root exudate that we're not getting, I think. And um, forage peas are something to be great if you're not using peas in your crop rotation, I think. So it didn't screw that part up. But uh, yeah, that's been my experience. We've tried all kinds of things. Yeah. And Corey, you mentioned vetch doesn't mess up your crop insurance. And can you explain that to me, please? Sure. So like, like on your crop insurance, it says if you seed a forage type of pea, you have the same rotation restrictions as it would be for yellow or green peas, right? Or for lentils, for that matter, it would affect that. Vetch isn't in that list. It's not, in their eyes, a crop that would really harbor disease that would increase their risk of insuring it. So you could literally seed a crop of vetch and then seed a crop of peas behind it and not have an issue on insurance anyways, right? So. Right, right. Okay. Um, we haven't had any issues with the vetch. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say we haven't had any issues with that vetch volunteering back to the point where it was oh. a problem. Yeah, that's another question that's commonly asked too, is, is if you got yeah. that, if that vetch overwinters at all. Yeah, and it, it could, I think potentially, but then usually we're always following that anyways with the small grains crop after the cover crop. And so we kill all the vetch out of it anyways. If you're organic, it might be trickier, right? I would think uh -huh. if you're going to rotate into lentils or something. Right. Okay. Doug asks, what kind of vetch, what variety do you use? Um, we were using hairy vetch, but then they couldn't get that in the cover crop seed and we switched to common vetch. And I, I can't really tell where one's a whole lot better than the other, to be honest with you. I know that hairy vetch, if you had a whole bunch of it in there, can have some cattle toxicity problems, I guess. But um, we've just now, all of our stuff, I think it says it's chickling vetch or something is what it is now in there. I believe in this cover crop mix, but right, uh, yeah, and, and it's and, not a lot of it, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. And one thing too is if you got four or five or six different species in there, you're probably not going to have a problem with toxicity toxicity with any one particular species, also. Right, and that, that's actually another reason we prefer millet over sorghum is that it limits. There's really not a lot that can go wrong with millet after a freeze or sorghum. There would be a little bit of risk, but pretty low if it's just part of the mix anyways, right? So, right. so for the warm season grass part, we started leaning more towards millet too, just for that reason. But we grazed some covers that had uh, safflower in it this fall of our neighbors. And I don't know that I would necessarily use that in there just because it's so spiny and pretty viney. And I, I, I don't know if it's going to hang around there for quite a while, I think. I don't do the cattle eat the, the safflower at all? They, they wouldn't. They would have early, I think. It, it sounded like my research I did, but later on, that stuff is so prickly when you're out there rolling the fence out, it pokes you through your pants or whatever. It's like Canadian thistle kind of stuff. So, yeah. Pretty, so right. That might be one to maybe avoid if you want to graze later in the fall, anyways. I think. But, yeah. Right. 
Anybody else have some questions for Corey before we move on to fancy? Oh, we got a couple here. Um, Doug says we grazed cattle on safflower early and they did not select for it. Did it they did not graze it. Oh yeah, that's good to know. That's what you're meaning. Is that right, Doug? They didn't graze it. Correct, he says. Yeah. Wasn't yeah, grazed. I, uh, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. And then we have another comment here um, from uh, Russell. And I'd like to know where you're at, Russell, but it's he says, log, logged in late. I have had great results with sun hemp, which is a warm season legume. So where are you at, Russell? Could you tell us again, Russell? We, I couldn't understand you anyway. Okay. Well, I think Russell, Russell has I, some audio um, issue there. Okay, maybe Russell, you could type it in and we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, sun hemp's a great legume. I don't know if it, I have not had a lot of experience with, with it in, in Montana. Um, I don't know if we have the heat units to grow sun hemp, but I'd be sure interested if somebody has had good experience with it in Montana. Um, Doug commented again, uh, he said, that the cattle did not graze it very well, but the density was low. So the cow, the stocking density was low. So maybe with higher stocking density that it might be grazed better, which is a good point. And a lot of times uh, that happens as a rule of thumb that we found on our operation, if, if you have problems with uh, livestock eating something or not eating something, just up the density and it, it really makes a big difference. So. Um, that can very well be right. He's from, Russell's from Eufaula, Alabama, the vast capital of the world. <laughs> yeah, I can see how Sunhamp's going to do very well in Alabama. That's great. Yeah. Good comment, though, because we've got people from all over the United States on this Zoom session. So that's great. Thank you, Russell. Hey, one comment that I have, Dave, about grazing on a cover crop mix uh we had buckwheat in a cover crop mix that we grazed with sheep and actually these were mature rams i was a graduate student that i was in charge of checking on them every day and watering and everything and i go out there on a bright sunny day they've been grazing this buckwheat cover crop mix and half of them were so neurologic they could barely move. They were stargazing, they were drooling. These were white face rams. They were completely sunburned all around their eyes. I mean, these were not tame rams and you could walk up to them and almost push them over. They couldn't even walk. And that's when I learned about buckwheat and sheep. And <laughs> if <laughs> as soon as we introduced shade, they were fine. So even just pulling the trailer into the pasture during the heat of the day if they could go lay down in the shade during the heat of the day they did just fine but for for a little bit there I was pretty worried that I was going to kill off our sheep flock at MSU and it was going to be on me but it, just so everyone knows if you didn't know buckwheat has a phototoxin that uh, especially white-faced sheep are uh, sensitive to so that was news to me and and you can graze it and we just added something where they could go and get out of the sun in the heat of the day cloudy days it wasn't as big of an issue but buckwheat was uh did cause that photosensitivity and devon was that a straight stand of buckwheat covered it crop? wasn't a straight stand and that's why yeah. i bring it up because it was a mixture and 
I can't remember what else was in there, but it was all very palatable. So it wasn't that they were just choosing the buckwheat, but there must have been just enough in there or those sheep in particular had a fondness for that buckwheat and maybe they ate more than the others. Right, right. Was, uh, uh, how long did it take them once you drove the trailers in there and provided shade for them to get better? By the next day, they looked much better. They had improved a lot and then we didn't see any issues. Maybe I still noticed a little bit of the sunburn around their eyes, but they weren't acting neurologic. They weren't stargazing they were they they acted normal oh that's cool well that's that's neat to know yeah has anybody on the call else had experiences with any toxicities in your cover crops with either cattle or graze or sheep grazing them Okay, I'll just read a few more comments sent in to the chat box. Uh, Russell continues by saying that sun hemp is a great protein and nitro fixer. It does not give bloat to any animals. He planted it in April and it lasted until December. Well, Russell, I think you've got everybody here in, in Montana Zen V tonight. <laughs> so that's great. Um, another thing that I've I've learned just talking to uh, uh, a University of Missouri professor lately that <clears throat> his um, name is Harley Nauman and he did a lot of research with introducing uh, um, sun hemp into tall fescue to try to get uh, increased forage value or incre increased forage quantity during the summer months when that fescue just about goes dormant in July and August. And they've had a lot of luck with that sun hemp, just interceding it right into existing um, pastures of tall fescue. It's a little bit off the point now, but it, it really is an interesting crop. And then Doug asks, he says, he's had some issues with sorghum as well. I definitely prefer millet as an alternate, an alternative uh, warm season grass. So Doug, did how was your yields on millet up there north of Haver, where you're at? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, this is Paul. Yeah, I'm not uh, quite certain about yield per se. We grazed a warm season cocktail mix that I think the dominant species in was probably the millet and they did about 15 animal days an acre. I'm more comfortable with animal days per acre as a unit myself. So I don't know how that translates to animal unit month per acre, but you know, it was pretty low producing, I would say. Um, but I, I subscribe that mainly to um, low moisture in the warm season, which is pretty typical for us. Right, okay, great. Well, thank you, Paul. I just should mention that Paul is a uh, uh, helping out Doug and Anna Crabtree up there as uh, an intern slash employee, and and he's a young person that's very interested in getting into agriculture, and so we really uh, love to see people like Paul joining our ranks. Um, Russell says, also plant moringa, which which is great. Now, Moringa is another um, warm season. I think it's a legume. Is that right, Russell? It's very definitely subtropical and it's got some pretty interesting characteristics. Uh, Rick says, Tyler, in your video, or, or, or Corey, in your video, those oats were setting off nitrate alarms in my head. Any issues? Uh, no, you know what? We did have really bad drought two years ago, and on we seeded that on some reasonably high nitrate ground or whatever, and we got about to the end of July before we actually have a portable nitrate tester, like a digital thing, and we would check it every couple of days. But um, I was a little worried between the oats and the turnips and radishes can actually harbor some nitrates too, and you throw all those together in there, but we didn't have any 
cattle health issues, but we did get up to where we were approaching it. I think we were trying to avoid about a thousand parts per million of nitrate or something, if I remember right, and we were testing it and we were, we were getting up into that 700 or so mark and we took the cattle off of there, but they were on there all the way up until it hadn't rained for about 30 days before there was that issue. So, and, and if it wasn't the whole part of the mix, I don't think it would be that big of an issue anyways. The other thing is with intensive grazing, we're, we're not keeping them on that till they eat all of the plant and most of the nitrates are in the bottom, right? And so they're usually ripping off about half of that plant and then moving on the next day. And so that kind of limits some of the nitrate problem if you don't get in the bottom end of the plant, I think. But yeah, and Corey, sense? I guess we should say you're moving every day. Is that right? Or pretty much so? Daily moves there. Yeah, that's right. Through that. So. Yeah, that makes a huge difference, uh, both in the amount of control you have over your grazing and and also just controlling what the cattle will graze because they graze from top down. So it's a great- Right, and that bo bottom inch or two of that plant's the highest nitrate accumulator, right? And so that, if you can avoid that, I think you're probably pretty safe, I would guess, but. Great, great. Uh, we have a question from Susan or a comment. She says, sometimes I've seen, quote, fog fever, unquote, type sy symptoms if stock is taken from dry or overgrazed pastured late season or in a dry season and put onto a lush cover crop pasture. Any comments on that? I, I guess we've never seen that really, but I, I don't know. Even our cover crop in the years when the pastures that dry isn't so lush usually. <laughs> so I guess maybe we don't have as much of a problem. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, Russell, Russell also asked, has anybody tried Balanza clover as a cover crop? I think this might be another Arkansas, Alabama type regional thing, but if we have anybody in the South that would care to comment on that for Russell. Okay. Well, Russell, we really thank you for joining us today. We don't want to make you feel like you're the only one, but it, it might be so from the Southeast. So that's great, thank you. Um, all righty. Any other questions before we move on to, to Tyrell? And we can always come back to Corey as we get more questions if that's what we're here for to do. Okay. And Doug Crabtree says, Balenza does not grow here in Montana. So that's good to know, okay. All right, uh, we're gonna move on now to Tyrell Obrecht's uh, snippets from his videos uh, that he, or his video that he made. And uh, Tyrell is up by Turner, Montana again. And we're gonna look at uh, a brief snippet on, on his fencing and then also on what kind of uh, uh, relationship he developed with his neighbors, the Joneses who are crop farmers. So it's, a, it's another different thing. One of the things we wanted to try to cover today is how do you, if you're renting crop ground or, or what kind of deals can you make? And so that's why we wanted to include that with Tyrell he, where he explains it. And also he's gonna show us some, a snippet of, of the cattle on the cover crop itself. So. Without any further ado, Marianne, could you please play it? Thank you. So now we're gonna put up another half mile of wire to the south. This will be the wire that we continue to move as we give the cows more crop. Uh, when we bring the yearlings on here, we're gonna have 170 yearlings on about 15 acres of cover crop. So somewhere around seven to 8,000 pounds of animal per acre. Uh, it's, eight or nine times more than what they see when they're out on the native range in the spring and summer. So it's a lot more dense. And uh, when we unroll this, I just sit here and hold the roll. My dad drives and then we get it tightened up and then we walk back down and put in posts and we're done. So that's all we got to do. And then we'll be set up and ready to bring cows on here. You want me to pull ahead while you're videoing? Yep, you're good, go ahead. <laughs>
Okay, thanks, Tyrell. Um, that was a short little thing on weight, uh, Tyrell uh, fences. Um, maybe we could have Ty describe it a little more in detail. What what that wire was and how he got it on that reel and and what kind of fence posts he's using and things like that. Please, Tyrell. Uh, yeah, and at first, I, I guess I don't do math very well under pressure. That number, I don't know, when you, I did some math, so the stock density was probably more like 10,000 pounds per acre. Um, but still, that's a lot more than, you know, than what they see on our native range. So that wire is just your standard uh, speed right cable electric fence. Uh, it comes in, well, you can get it in a quarter mile roll, but it's way cheaper to get it in a mile roll. I think by the time, by the time you buy a mile of it in quarter mile sections, it's almost $400. And if you can get it in a mile section, it's just one big roll, it's 300. So what we've been doing is dad and I built a unroller um, that has a disc it didn't have a disc the first time we tried to unroll wire and we learned quickly it needed a disc. And uh, we just drive the four wheeler or the side by side and we unroll it off this mile spool. And then as, as we roll these half mile spools back, you know, it's just that black plastic spool. We weld a three quarter nut on the uh, axle of it, so to speak. And then we just take an electric drill, uh, Milwaukee DeWalt cordless with a, with a three quarter socket put it on there and you just, you hold the wire with your hand and run the drill and you can roll up a half mile of wire in a couple minutes, three minutes, maybe. Um, the, the post, we just use the, the, the pigtails, your standard pigtail post every 50 or 60 feet. If we're going through a low spot, uh, we haven't done a lot of electric fencing in any, any hilly terrain, but we'll, we'll, we'll shorten up that distance if there's a hill or a, you know, a coulee or something, but on that flat farm ground about every 50 to 60 feet. And then that wire, what that wire was, so we we had a spring where the cattle grazed and that wire was was basically the barrier that limited how much they could eat. So that was about a four day deal. After four days, we moved the wire further to the west and just gave them more and more, more and more uh, cover crop to, to eat. Right. And so Tyrell, did you back fence them or was it just the lead fence that you moved every, every, when you moved uh, it? Yeah, kind of yes and no. We did back fence them so they, because the, there was some uh, lentil and spring wheat stubble on the way to the spring. So we did kind of fence an alley just to limit how much they went and grazed that stubble. I guess that, answer, that answers your question. Yeah, right. And, and the wire that... Uh, Tyrell's speaking about um, the, that speed right sells. It, it's actually, uh, some people call it airplane wire and it's yeah. really strong stuff. Uh, and I think Ty is, when you reel it in, you just stand in one place with your drill, right? And it just comes through onto the reel. Is that right? Yeah, so like in this case, we had the wire tied on on the north end on a permanent fence. And then on the south end was another permanent fence. So we would we would just unhook where the wire was tied, drive to the south end, and just stand there. And and uh, you can do it by yourself, but sometimes my dad would run the drill and I would guide the wire with my hand or whatever. But yeah, I mean, you just it's pretty it's pretty tough stuff we found. Right. Um, it is silver wire, uh, and so did you have any problem with the cattle not seeing it? Um, not that I know of, um, you know, the cattle, I guess if they didn't see it, they clearly got bit by it. Cause the first couple times you move that wire, they know where the line is and they're, they're very hesitant to cross that. And then, you know, typically yearlings they're uh, once one does, they all do, but I, I, I have never seen like a cow just bulldoze through it because she didn't see it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. The other nice thing about that wire is it really conducts electricity. Um, in regular poly wire, you, you might lose a couple thousand volts, at least I would think over a half mile. And this uh, airplane wire, I don't, did you lose any, any voltage drop, Ty? Yeah, maybe, um, 
You know, truthfully, maybe a couple thousand volts over a, over an entire mile, but on a on a half mile stretch, no. I mean, if you're testing whatever nine kilovolts on on the north end, you'll test nine kilovolts on the south end, pretty regular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So it is a nice it is a nice wire. It uh, it is a little bit heavier than poly wire, so that's kind of a downside of it. But other than that, it it it's tough and it's. It's probably a lot tougher than the poly wire. Corey uses a rope uh, braided wire. Could you tell us about that, Corey? Sure, yeah, so it's called poly braid. There, it, it looks just like that plastic wire that, what, what do you call the other stuff? I'm trying to think, uh, well, it's just- Poly wire? Yeah, the poly wire, there you go. But that, that poly wire has plastic strands that run through it. This poly braid has more kind of like a rope weaving in it and it, it holds up way better and rolls up just as much on a spool as that poly wire would. It just doesn't come on corked. That other stuff, we had so much trouble with that plastic breaking and then the metal braids breaking in it. And this stuff, I, we rolled it up and back hundreds of times and never had an issue. So if I was gonna buy something, I'd always buy poly braid or that stuff looks really cool that Tyrell's using too. I've never tried that, but um, that poly braid wire is way better than the, just the plain old poly braid or whatever, or the poly wire, I mean, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. I really enjoyed your input, Ty and Corey, on that, because fencing is a, you know, it's one of the big things you got to solve. And the other big thing you got to solve is water, uh, getting the water to the cattle or, or the sheep. And uh, so I think, Marianne, if you could play the next snippet where, Tyrell kind of describes his, his uh, whole grazing map there and where his water source is. Oh no, this is gonna be the, his dealings and how he worked out a relationship with his uh, neighbors. So let's view that too. So I just wanted to touch on the logistics of the uh, cover crop, what we've done, kind of answer a few things that don't regard uh, the farming side of it or really the cow side. Uh, Dad and I, Put up electric fence it took us about one 1.75 miles to get everything in that we wanted needed an alleyway to a spring uh, about three three hours to do that and that that includes some some running around and backtracking because we, we forgot a few things so i think your labor requirements pretty minimal uh, the fencing part is 100 percent on, on us as far as electric fence goes and then we split the border fence with jones farms 50 50. So that's, that's who takes care of the electric fence. Um, once that's up and we continue to move our alleys or, uh, or increase the paddock, so to speak, you're looking at about a half hour at a time just to go on, unhook the fence. And, and instead of rolling the wire up and moving it, since we're only moving it about 30 or 40 feet, we just, just continue to move that line further west down the field. So. That's who takes care of all that. Uh, the labor is done by dad and I, we don't have to hire any any extra labor done. Um, this is something we kind of plan to do once once we got the hay up, we'd kind of develop a plan and then we, we got to it here. After the calves got preconditioned this fall. Um, as far as the residual goes, we're gonna leave about half. We, we pay for half of the seed. Joneses pay for the other half, so we're not, we're not trying to totally graze it down so it looks like a kitchen table, uh, but we are kind of playing with it and seeing seeing how it looks if we move them every five days or every seven days. So that's that's our first goal. The, our first move is going to be a, a seven day move. We'll we'll see how much residual they leave, and if if we go there in five days and we think it's time to move them, we will. If there's uh, enough material left after seven days, we'll leave them there longer. So that's that's kind of our goal there, and then um, they're about they're about two miles away from the cover crop now. So on, on a morning when it's cool, we'll just trail them the whole way, and we'll we'll give them fr free grain and kind of let them, you know, the yearlings will kind of run around the perimeter and they'll they'll find the water and they'll find the cover crop. But we find after a couple of days they settle down and and they're 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 mostly on that on that forage. So. That's kind of how we go everything from a logistics standpoint. Um, not really a lot of labor into the electric fence, really. I don't think anyway, and and uh, it's it's pretty simple once everything's set up as far as moving it goes and and maintaining that boundary. 
So as you can see, I pursued a career in ranching because art did not work out. But I wanted to kind of show this, this hard line around here is the border fence. This would be our pasture to the north of Jones's. And then to the south here, Jones's have the, the cover crop. And then there's, there's a diverse rotation with, with lentils, different cereals as, as I explained before, but that's, that's kind of how they rotate. So what we did, the squiggly line is the electric fence. So we just ran an alley about a half a mile and then we went straight south. And then this line right here going north and south, this is allowing about 15 acres of cover crop. Okay, great. Um, any questions on on uh, how to approach a neighbor or anything like that? What as Ty's done uh, to get access to a cover crop? Uh, I, this is kind of a uh, a neat way that Tyrell's done it. Um, you know, because a lot of us, you know, that are ranching don't have the equipment or. Uh, maybe even the know-how to cr crop, and uh, we're, we got more knowledge in running cattle. Uh, so, Tyrell, could you just tell us what, uh, how you approached the Joneses in the first place, and how you got on an even keel and and were able to work together? Um. So, if you don't mind, Dave, I just this will. I'll tell you this story so I can tell you the next story. And I sure. see Doug, Doug, Doug Crabtree added, asked me to uh, some more background about our total operation. So we, uh, we do farm a little bit. It's a very small, uh, just everything we farm is, is to grow hay barley for, for winter forage for our cow, cows. And we're actually, uh, if it ever quits snowing in September, we're going to seed uh, all of our farm ground back to grass and uh, kind of do some different things for forage. And then, so we're focusing 100% on the cows. And I moved home three years ago. I worked for Wells Fargo Bank in Billings and Lewistown. Uh, my, my wife got a job in Haver and my grandpa was wanting to slow down and my dad lost his hired man. Pretty much all in the same couple months. So I've been in Turner since October, 2017. And uh, Andrew Jones uh, farms with his dad and his uncle. And uh, Andrew's a few years older than me. He moved back to Turner a, a little bit earlier than I did, but pretty much the same time. And when Andrew was working in Oklahoma, uh, a lot of agronomy stuff and in, in, intense crop rotations and Andrew's, Andrew's dad and uncle had they were cropping a little bit more than 50 50 but you know probably your traditional farmers i guess you could call it so andrew wanted to try some of this stuff uh and andrew will tell you he knows absolutely nothing about cows and i know absolutely nothing about farming uh other than i don't like it so he uh he he had read a lot of different things and his dad and uncle and he are trying a three-year three years of cover crop on the same chunk of ground. And, uh, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to buy the cows or, or uh, approach another neighbor to do it. So dad and I said, we would be interested. And uh, we just decided Andrew approached us with the 50, 50 method. So that was, that was kind of his idea. And um, I think it's fair because we're not totally hammering it, grazing it down. Like, you know, some other pictures of, of cover crop grazing you have seen. And um, I mean, it's, 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 it's been really good because like I said, it's one family that wants to focus strictly on cows and that's what they know. And then the other family with farming and uh, we'll have one more year next year. And then they're actually gonna move the cover crop the year after that closer to the spring. Uh, and that, that chunk of farm ground pretty much entirely borders our pasture. So the logistics will be really easy. Okay, great, great. We got a couple of questions in the comment box here. Um, I think you did uh, answer that one just now, Tyrell, about telling us more of the background on your total operation. And um, Michael says, a few farms in Indiana have tried Balanza clover 
seeded in August, early September in a mix for grazing and cover ahead of corn, or as a dominant species in a simple mix or monoculture in attempts at no-till organic corn. Challenge is winter survivability, it seems. Well, thanks for that comment, Michael, that's great. Um, let's move on now, unless there's some more questions on, on the uh, negotiations with uh, a neighbor, uh, like Tyrell's done with his neighbor, uh, we'll move on. And another really big topic is getting water to the cows. Um, so Corey, Maybe you could tell us how, you, how you're doing that in your situation, please. Sure, so most of our intensive grazing stuff's all off a of well water back somewhere at a farmyard. And so now we're working on digging in more pipelines, but as up to now when he was, we've been just laying HPDE pipe out on top of the ground, like inch and a quarter pipe. And we got these quick splice things are kind of like a shark bite fitting where you can pop them apart real easy or whatever and put T's in there and then we'll put a T every 500 feet in that HPDE pipe. And then that runs out to like a K line. It looks like a big Richie water or thing that you drag around the stainless steel. We were doing that. And then some of the pastures that's not practical on. So we'll just put stock tanks maybe every quarter mile or whatever in the middle using that black plastic pipe and then work out both directions from the stock tank basically. But we're not lucky enough to have um, ponds for the most part or creeks or anything. So it's all some sort of well water situation and it's all done with that black plastic pipe. So, but, uh, which works fine until it gets hot. If it's on top of the ground and there's not much grass covered, then that water gets pretty hot once you get a mile out or so on that stuff, it seems like. So, it's, uh, and Corey, could you tell us, I thought it was really neat what you did to try to cool that water down too. Neat little trick. Oh, as far as burying it or the? Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, so some of that, we just buried some of that pipe only about a foot deep just to be fast with the backhoe or whatever, right? And then just left the splices out of the ground. And that actually did work really well. We buried about a thousand feet and it cooled that water down substantially even when you got three quarters of a mile out. So so that, that, that works. Ideally, you'd have it all buried under the ground, but that just takes time, right? Sometimes not practical, but on the flip side, that stuff like you actually told me is way better when it's cold out for not freezing, right? Or whatever, as far as um, pushing it down to cooler temperatures than what like a garden hose would handle or something. So um, there's yeah. pluses and minuses. Though. Yeah. Right. We found, of course, we're on a much, much, much smaller scale, but we found that if we just leave uh, the water running, you know, like half a gallon a minute, uh, it'll go down to about zero for a week before it freezes solid. And most of our, and that's just on a lateral, our main lines where the water moves more uh, during the day and night, um, we really haven't had a, a place except, I think it was 20 below once where that thing shut off. But uh, uh, by then we usually had snow too and, and sheep and cattle will eat snow if they're trained to do it sheep do it just automatically but a lot of cattle will do it too um so I, that brings to another question on the have you guys had experience with cattle eating snow on these covers in the winter uh yeah i, I guess oh yeah i uh so last year last year we were grazing it and it was a different mix than we use this year a, a much, you know, a lot better results, a lot more rain last year, but we got uh, Northern Montana got a foot of snow in September, heavy, wet snow, and another, basically another foot of snow in every month until March. And uh, dad and I found in, in October when that next snow came, things were starting to freeze up. So we shut off the well that we had been using and uh, the cows did have free access to that spring, but uh, they were pretty, pretty heavily concentrated on that cover crop. Uh, the snow was so heavy and wet. I mean, you could pull up, you could reach down and pull like a, like a bench plant out. And I mean, that, that bench, that bench plant was soaking wet just from all the snow. So I think just by, just by grazing and, and being involved in that, you know, that kind of climate, the cows, 
I don't, I'm not going to take credit for training them, but we were really surprised at how little water they went after when there was, you know, that kind of snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. Corey, did you have a comment on that? Oh, I was just going to say, we were hauling some water this fall, actually, to some covered crop of a neighbor's that we were grazing and, and it snowed. We were hauling like about a thousand gallons of water a day to like 70 pairs there or whatever. And it went all the way down to like, I think we figured it out at like 200 gallons of water a day they were drinking after that snow. So I, hmm. I see the point. I mean, it was kind of a little accidental experiment, right? Because you kind of monitor what you're hauling there. And it, it definitely, I think they would do just fine on it from what I can tell or what Gabe Brown does seems to work, I guess. So... But it's kind of hard not to have any water out there, right? I don't know. I'm not ballsy enough to do that, I guess. I yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, to put it in context, I think Gabe does provide water, but it's about a mile, maybe two back to the water. And so the cattle just figure out pretty quick. It's easier to eat snow than it is to walk two miles. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, and I'm sure... Uh, there's always some cattle that fall out too. And you just sure. gotta let them fall out. Um, we got a question here or a comment. Um, Russell says he prefers aluminum wire. It conducts better than steel. I use hot wire addition to using hog wire or sheep fence because I want better protection from predators. Have too many friends lose a lot of Stock calves, sheep, and goat from predators, including neighborhood dogs packing together to attack stock. Yeah, especially with small ruminants, that's, that's always a question uh, and something you're trying to prevent with their fence. A lot of times it's, it's as much uh, keeping predators as out, out as it is keeping sheep especially in where they're supposed to be. So yeah, those fences have a dual purpose. Uh, uh, just as a little aside, um, we did pencil out um, uh, once a couple years ago what it, the difference would be if you use nets on a cover crop up, actually it was up in Paul and Doug's place up there and uh, up north of Haver. And uh, it was quite comparable. If you hired a college student, paid him, him $20 an hour, to put up about four acres of nets, just electric nets every day, move the sheep every day on about, I think we had about eight or 900 yearling uh, weathers. Um, and there was probably 12 or 1300 pounds of dry matter. So we had to do about, I think we worked out four acres a day we had to move. And so that's pretty close to 60 or 70 nets that that person did. Um, and four hours, maybe five a day, setting up nets and hauling water. And it was about $3,000 a month, which is pretty much comparable to uh, hiring a Peruvian herder. So if you can't get a herder, I'm sure there's some college kids down at MSU that would love to be paid 20 bucks an hour. Um, anyway, uh, Paul says, on, as an organic farm, we feel that the benefits from grazing and terminating the cover crops are worth as much as the forage value. I think Corey kind of alluded to that too. Uh, anybody else have comments on that? It gets back to why we're, we're, we're putting cover crops in in the first place and second place why we're grazing them. Hey, Dave, if I apologize, but could you... Either, either Paul or Corey, could you explain kind of what you mean there? The benefits from grazing and terminating the cover crop are worth as much as the forage value. So the, the benefits for who, I guess, and, and I just want a little clarification. Paul, sure. can you so, come on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I can, I can kind of explain, I guess, from my standpoint anyways here, if you... Go ahead, Corey. Oh, is that right? Okay, so... Our, to me now, the more we learn about this soil health stuff and how we've done a bunch of some PLFA tests on our soil and all that, and all we have basically is bacteria there, right? Because we screwed it all up. And those cattle, 
drop all these perfect little petri dishes of protozoa and nematodes and all this other stuff in the ground that we don't have. And so from the farmer's perspective, I think, or from our farm side of it, the benefit of what the cattle are doing biology wise, the soil may actually almost outweigh the grazing value of the cover crop. I mean, we get the benefit from both sides and so it's a no brainer, but what you're doing for that partner farmer of yours, I think long-term is hugely beneficial to his soil too, right? And so way more than seeding a cover crop and terminating it with Roundup or something, no doubt, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, I guess my point was, I, I don't feel like the farm needs to be paid anything for the grazing because we're getting more out of it than, you know, in our circumstance as an organic farm, we're getting more out of that in terms of soil health benefit than, than anything that it might cost us. And, you know, it's only, it's all good from our side, I guess. Thank you, Doug. Well, Hey Doug, if you want to come organic farm and Turner and be my neighbor, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your cows. We got lots of land and cover crops. Yeah. It's not that yeah. far. You can yeah, well, at least they're used to the climate. That's right. <laughs> Cattle drive. Yeah. I think you guys are only about 20 miles away, aren't you? Oh, probably as a crow flies 50. 50? Okay. Um, well, that's great. Um, you know, that's kind of what we like to hear. And, and also, you know, there, I really think that this livestock integration is going to catch on more and more. And after farmers see what that does to the soil and extending that out, you're gonna have less fertilizer costs. You know, you're probably gonna have better uh, crops that weather a drought better. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of things that integrating livestock onto a cover crop situation are gonna bring you in, in, you know, maybe not the next year, but five years down the road, you're gonna see it, so. I think that's what Doug's trying to say and Corey's saying. Um, so it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting and profitable thing to do. Um, can Tyrell, can you or Corey or both of you just sort of give us some insights on on we talked about how you integrated your livestock and with your crops uh, and why we we just talked about that now. If we could talk about when, um, when to do it, kind of the logistics and, and how it interrelates with the particular crop that you're growing as a cover crop and, and just the whole ball of wax. You know, if you, if you start putting those cattle on there too early, it doesn't, you know, they eat the crop up really fast and it doesn't, may not grow back fast enough. So what's your strategies in there? Say, let's start with a full season cover crop first. I'll let Corey go first. Okay, so uh, what we're doing with the full season covers usually is leaving them till about the middle of July, just because for us, that's when they're, they've grown up enough to graze, but then that's also when our grass gets short. And so it kind of fits with what we're trying to do here. I, what we want to do more if, as we get more stuff fenced with heated water situations is leave a bunch of that for fall grazing, like fall into the winter situation. So we don't use as much hay. Right. And I, I think that would probably make the most sense. And then a lot of it, uh, like we might have barley that's in a block that actually is fenced the volunteers back and then that's not really a seeded cover crop but it's awesome forage in the fall right and so there there's uses after the crop comes off if you get enough rain to get volunteer which is just free beneficial stuff too i guess does that make sense i know sure yeah ty were you gonna add anything to that no not really um so for us as long as we're doing the yearlings it works best for us to get the bulls pulled, get them preg checked and uh, get them over there in September when, you know, the grass is, is probably definitely the lowest quality. And then I just really agree with what Corey said. I mean, dad and I have a profitable haying enterprise. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that feeding, feeding is as evil as maybe some people, but I, I mean, you also really got to run the numbers and Every day that cow can munch on a cover crop instead of munch on a flake of hay, it's, it's money in your pocket. So as, as late as possible without sacrificing the quality is, is when I think we, 
we should graze and when, when we have grazed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that also begs the question of, are you able to terminate your, your cover crop well enough with cattle? Have any problems with it coming back the next spring? Um, and since both you guys are, are not organic, uh, if you kind of put yourself in an organic producer's shoes, do you see anything with your cover crops that might go through the winter and pose a problem? I, we've had nothing really in the spring when you're pre-spraying even volunteer back in there, which is really strange because some of this cover crop is setting seed before we graze it. But there, I, I don't understand what's going on there if it's triggered like soil biology triggered situation or what it is. But as long as we graze across that and knock it back pretty good and some of it might come back and set seed, we haven't had a huge volunteer issue especially you kind of worry about like those oats coming back in the weed or something, right? Cause we're not spraying for oats in the weed anymore, but that has never happened ever in the cover. So it's kind of a interesting thing. Maybe it's one of the benefits of being so horrendously cold where we live too, or something, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's not a lot that will overwinter that's in there if it starts in the fall, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Cold and wind, right? Yeah. I guess that's one benefit. <laughs> yeah. Doug, I, do you have any thoughts? You're an organic farmer. Uh, have you had any problems or do you have any concerns with, with the cover crop being terminated? Um, this is Paul here. I'll kind of okay, speak, Paul. Yeah. speak to that too, because part of this is part of my contribution to how we integrate the cattle. Um, our main concern with terminating cover crop is making sure that we're still getting the nitrogen fixing benefit. So for us inside of our cover crop rotation, what we grazed this year is primarily, primarily a legume cover crop in the rotation. And I want to terminate that before it goes to seed, right? So that the nitrogen that it's fixed remains in the soil and is readily available uh, mm -hmm. for the next crop. And, and also to stop using moisture. So what we did this year was swathed all of the cover crop that we were gonna graze. And then I grazed it in the swaths using, um, you know, some intensive methods with high concentration and electric fence to really clean up the swaths. And that also helped me to maintain uh, quality longer through the season because I didn't have a, a large number of animals and I had a large number of acres to, to run through. So um, we'll, we're going to see, I guess, in the spring, what the consequence of that practice is in terms of volunteer for us. That's definitely a concern, but we, we don't actually have enough data, I guess, yet to answer that question about the, the consequence of cover crop grazing in the following cash crop year. Looks good so far. Yeah. Great. That, that brings up a really good point too, because on you know, when we got, or you guys have thousands of acres and maybe hundreds of acres in cover crops um, and getting, pointing to getting more acres in cover crops in the future, uh, how are you going to terminate them all? You know, and like was one, one uh, crop farmer told me there was enough cattle in his county to, to terminate his acres, you know, but that is another way of of skin and the cat is is uh, is swathing them, and then you've got a full winter winter ahead of you of feed. Um, so that's another alternative, something that you can kind of pursue on it. Um, let's see, we got a, a question here. Rick asks, Corey mentioned rethinking a mix and plan for a fall winter cover. What are those thoughts and what are Tyler's in the same regard? Tyrell, he says, excuse me. Any thoughts, you guys? Sure, like something that we're gonna use for fall grazing more so than the summer, is that kind of what he's asking? I yeah. think that's what Rick's is, is getting to, yeah. Um, you know, the stuff, what we've seen that seems to hold on pretty good in the fall, like those oats are good because they, 
they just keep going regardless of daylight till they freeze pretty hard. And then those collards never bolt, right? And so they hang on and provide a lot of protein. And then maybe we throw some vetch in there or something. But what we're trying this year, so we seeded some winter triticale that we're going to uh, actually calve across here with the cows. And so that got seeded in the fall. This is getting off topic, I guess, but it's going to hopefully come back in the spring. And then we're going to try and sow some sort of maybe forage peas or something into that and then graze across the whole thing. Cause we, we can't get the forage peas to make it through the winter, but we might be able to sow them in. It's only 150 acres. So we could knife those in with that disc drill, hopefully into that triticale and have them come together. I don't know. We're going to see what happens. It might be a train wreck, but it'd be. That so that would be early spring, Corey, you're going to do, put the peas? I mean, what we wanted to do is tr graze the triticale in the fall some, but it never did get started this fall yet because it hadn't rained really enough, and then it snowed right away. So mm -hmm. it's our ongoing saga of not getting the fall cover crop to work, right? But we're going to try. <laughs> right. In the spring. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, uh, Russell says, great information I found on, improve in, on improving water quality, which is just as important as soil quality, will help increase production and animal health. And it's in your chat box. He's got a link there. Um, Carl DePolt uh, mentioned managing cover crops profitably. That's a, that's a SARE publication. And I totally agree. Uh, that's a great resource to use. Um, it's got every, every crop species you can think of, a little bit about each one and where they fit into a cover crop. So it's a really good primer on, on using cover crops. Um, one last thing before we let you guys, Corey and, and Ty go, uh, I'd really like to ask Corey if he could just sort of explain uh, to us how much of his, his ground he's giving up on crop insurance and why, and what are all the factors that go into that, making that decision? Sure. So the stuff that we just can't insure basically or whatever, because of whatever reason, is that what you're asking? So yeah, um, some of that, I mean, the cover crop's somewhat of a risk because we can't insure that, right? And so there's probably, anywhere from 200 to 400 acres a year of that. So not, not a lot, but then we found stuff like chickpea flax or um, mustard and yellow peas grow really well together. And then we're separating those like an intercrop situation in the fall. And obviously the bank won't let us do a huge amount of that, but we can do three to 500 acres a year of uninsured crop because I think the risk outweighs the benefit on that end of it too, you know, from what I can tell. Everywhere from the chemical inputs to the two crops over yielding when they're put together, I think. Uh, so long story short, probably five to 800 acres a year. I don't want to push that too hard because I'm a crop insurance agent too, right? So. <laughs> right. <laughs> Corey, do you foresee yourself in the future uh, having less and less, I don't know, if, do you have any fallow now at all? We don't, we have no fallow in our, inputs like our fertilizer is at least half what it was if not less than that i would say and we're not spraying for oats anymore in the crop a bunch of that was just done through diverse cropping and all those weeds start going away and your fertilizer demands go down right and hopefully this fall we're going to do some compost tea or this spring maybe do some compost tea work injected through the drill because if we can get that part of the biology ramped up then i think we can really cut some costs you know but and, uh, it's a good point and it just gets back to what we're going to talk to to Devin a little bit about in a minute is is there's a lot of little things that fit into the equation and it's not just one thing it's not just integrating livestock it's not not just crop rotation it's it's not just adding some inputs that really might be do you some good like compost tea or solid compost it's the whole ball of wax that just kind of elevates your whole soil health and your profit. And, and it, it takes more than one year to do it. Obviously, it, you know, it might take half a generation, but you're, as long as you're moving forward, you're making progress. Um, let's see, I, uh, before we go on any further, um, 
and get to Devin. Uh, can we just take a, a short poll while we got you listeners? And it, it's just four or five questions. And Marianne, could you beam that poll to us, please? Are we all in, Marianne? Uh, let's give it another uh, about uh, 20 seconds. OK, great. Hey, Corey, totally irrelevant question. Are you north or south of the Sweetgrass Hills? We're straight west, basically. You know, just a slightly south, about 10 miles to the west, I guess it would be. Okay. Right where the land starts getting crappy, basically. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and rocky, I suppose, right, Corey? Rocky, rocky and crappy. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, at least you can see mountains from there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're right. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Take your pick, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, Marianne just tapped me over the shoulder digitally, you might say, and, and said, When are we going to show the last snippet from Tyrell? So, Marianne, if you could show that to us, that's great. That'd be great. It just talks about or shows the cattle grazing on the cover crop. All right, we just got the yearlings on here. 170. Uh, we don't know an exact acreage. I'd say they have about 15 acres. We'll have some contrast where the electric fence sat and where it didn't. And, and hopefully get that crop terminated with cattle. So this is the fifth time we've moved them now. I think they've gotten used to the side by side. They followed us all the way down to here and they're right onto fresh feed. Okay, great. I thought that was a, a really neat thing what uh, Tyrell showed us, you know, the aftermath of his grazing on the covers and kind of gives you a, a uh, benchmark of what to look for. Any comments, Tyrell, on, on, on that? You know, did it work for you well? Is, are the Jones just happy with what you left behind? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Andrew, they're happy with the results so far. They're going to go forward with it. Dad and I are really happy. Uh, this doesn't have to do with cover crops, but this spring we, we, we had some 30 acre pastures, which is exponentially smaller than anything ever is up here. And uh, we kind of found after the first couple moves, you get to drop in that wire and those cattle move themselves. And uh, this was first time calvers. The calves were about a month old at this point. And, uh, you know, I don't want to pat my own back or my dad's too hard, but I really think that speaks to quality stockmanship. The cattle are moving quietly. You're not pinholing them through a gate. 
And uh, even if you do move them through a gate, when you kind of get to that point with this kind of management, you just open the gate and the cows move themselves. And uh, it's it's a pretty good feeling. I, I don't know how to put a profit number on it, but I think as far as animal stress, it's way down when you move them that way. Hmm. Yeah, I think Corey, you might be able to speak to that too with your moving your cattle. Oh yeah, for sure. I like there's just a lot less chaos or whatever stress, like you said, and then they will, I actually went and opened a gate across a pasture into another spot. We were going to intensive graze and they actually went all the way across the pasture up the hill and put themselves all in a gate. And I've never seen that ever happen in my life, you know, so <laughs> it was probably just a fluke, but I took a video of it just to prove it. Cause I thought this is, yeah, <laughs> but no, they just handle different anyways. They do for sure. And, yeah. And they're on good feed all the time, right? Because you you just, they're not just selecting for the stuff they want, but at least they're always on good feed because you're leaving half. Yeah. You're moving across. So. Yeah, that seems to have a lot to do with it too. If they're always happy and contented, they're going to work for you instead of be a bunch of orangutans out there. Right. Okay. Um, any other questions with Corey and Tyrell? Uh think if not, we are going to move on over to Devin so she can quickly describe her project. And um, one of the neat things that, that she did was her feedlot on fields. And so I'd really like to give Devin a chance to, to tell us what she did and what she found out. Devin? Yeah, so our goal or our objective for our research was to compare three different farming systems. And we had an integrated livestock system that was organic using sheep. And we had a tilled organic system. And then we had a conventional system where we could use chemicals. And we also wanted for the feedlot on fields research, which I thought was a really neat project, we wanted to look at the impacts of finishing lambs out on wheat stubble fields and then compare that to lambs finished in confinement. Um, we looked at the impact on soil health and then we also looked at the impact on the sheep. And what we found when you look at soil health is compaction was a big concern of ours. Having sheep out there on these fields, we were worried, especially during the wetter fall months, if they were going to compact that soil and that was going to end up being an issue for spring seeding. And really what we found, at least in, in our area in Montana and the great northern plains, because we have such a severe freeze and thaw cycle throughout the winter and the spring is that any compaction that those sheep did to the soil actually was broken up over those winter months, months and in, into the spring because the ground is freezing and then it's thawing and it's freezing and it's thawing and it kind of actually levels the playing field and erases that compaction. So uh, that was really a positive thing that we found that you know, when farmers are worried about integrating livestock, is it going to compact my soil and be a detriment? Really, we, di we didn't see that. Uh, we also looked at the soil microbial communities uh, between our three farming systems. And we did see that two uh, microbes that play a role in plant growth and health actually were found more frequently in our two organic systems compared to our conventional system. When you look at the sheep side of things, we so comparing sheep finished in confinement versus compare or finished in the confinement pens um, versus out on the field, the sheep that were finished out on the fields with exactly the same diet actually had bigger ribeyes and higher ending body weights than those in confinement. And I, I was a little unsure how that would end up. It seemed like the sheep that were out on the fields were running around playing. They had a lot more room to exercise compared to the sheep that were in confinement. And I kind of thought, oh, they're sitting around in confinement. They might eat more out of boredom. But really, we saw sheep out on the fields uh, did finish better than sheep in confinement. So it was really a neat thing to find. Thank you, Devin. Any, any questions for Devin? Her research, she's just wrapping up her research in the next, what, four or five months. Devin, is that right? Your paper's gonna be in and 
Yeah, um, hopefully if everything goes right, COVID has, has kind of slowed things down for everything for labs for for doing our soil microbe testing has kind of had a huge backlog, but we're we we see the light at the end of the tunnel here and we're finishing up as quick as we can. Right. So I'm interested in, in, in that final paper myself, and, and I think it's really uh, great research, which Devin's done. And I, I'm really hoping that MSU will, will use it as a springboard to, to do more research on integrating livestock with uh, crops, both residual crops and aftermath grazing and also cover crops. Um, let's see, we have one new message. Um, Doug asks, how successful were the sheep at terminating your cover crops? For Devin. Uh, for the feedlot on fields, they were just grazing or they were, they weren't actually grazing, but they were housed on wheat stubble fields and they weren't expected to consume that wheat stubble. And prior uh, cover crop grazing, we've had great success uh, terminating cover crops with sheep. And we have terminated big, large fields, small, tiny little fields, and a ton of different crops. We actually, um, at one of our farms, our organic farms that we grazed at here in Bozeman, we had a, a field next door to our cover crop field that was kale and arugula. And we put sheep in there just kind of as an experiment to see what they would eat. And the sheep love kale and they really do not like arugula. So we had to really, we, they leave them there a long time to, to convince them to touch that spicy arugula. But it's been kind of fun to, to experiment with different kind of crops and see what the sheep will eat. And uh, especially I, I enjoy doing uh, grazing crop aftermath and just seeing what the sheep will clean up when we're done. We did some sheep grazing at our town's harvest farm in Bozeman. And there was everything out in this field. There was corn, cabbage, cilantro. And the sheep actually learned to put the corn stalk between their front legs and they would walk down the stalk and push it over, eat all the leaves, eat the top of the stalk and then keep walking and it would flip up behind them. <laughs> uh, or, or watching sheep try to eat cabbage. Just, you know, they'd eat the leaves that are sticking out, but there's still a head of cabbage there and trying to gnaw on the head of cabbage or consuming cilantro when the sheep were eating cilantro or any uh, of those other herbs. Man, they, they just smell delicious, which makes me want to write a grant and see if we can have any kind of uh, effect on the flavor of the lamb by feeding them certain things like cilantro or mint or rosemary. <laughs> yeah. Well, great, Devin. Thank you. Doug uh, and Paul say, can you bring a few bands up here next spring? <laughs> you know, I, I think the cover crop grazing has been so much fun. I think Corey and Tyrell mentioned this a little bit too, but they're just, they're always on excellent, really high quality feed. And so, especially with our sheep, we're usually having to move them by trailer to, to different grazing sites. And we've gone, you know, everywhere in Bozeman and Belgrade and then up to Big Sandy or up to Moccasin. And um, even with the stress of transport, when they get off the trailer and they have that lush cover crop to consume, they're, they're happy. Right. Well, we're about, uh, we're about to the end of our time that we promised uh, we'd, we'd give our, our, partners here. And if there's any other last minute questions uh, that you'd like to ask Tyrell, Corey, or Devin, we'll entertain those and then we'll have to sign off. I guess uh, Doug says, uh, uh, is there anyone, has anybody had a, or if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to call. I need about 1500 sheep. <laughs> So you know, any of you out there that, uh, that have sheep, um, I just contact me. I can get you a hold of Doug and we can do that. And as far as that goes, um, uh, if you guys have any further questions, um, if you want to contact me, I would get them to Corey and Devin and Tyrell. Um, my 
email is d-a-v-e-s at ncat.org. So you can get a hold of me easy, just Dave S at ncat.org. Um, also, if you go to the webinar um, that we had on integrating livestock with crops, you can get Devin's email there, or you can go to the um, videos that Corey and Tyrell made. Their contact information is right there on that page and in those videos. So lots of ways to get a hold of us and we really encourage it and and Tyrell and Corey and and Devin they're really enthused about what they're doing and helping others and so I'm sure they'll be glad to to help you um, so I I thank you everybody for coming today and uh, this this zoom session is being recorded and it will be up on the Atra site um, in probably no less than a week and so if you have know of anybody who would like to have been here but wasn't able to tonight, just tell them to Google Atra and, and you'll find it. So we want to thank our, our great farmers and our researcher that have been with us today, Corey and Tyrell and Devin, and, and we just give them a big loud clap. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. We'll see you. Bye-bye.